to welcome you to worship this morning. I'm Reverend Philip Newman. I am here uh, at West Vancouver United Church, and where I'm located, it is a warm morning. And I wonder how warm or how cool it might be for you who are joining us online uh, today or through the week when you catch up with this worship service. Whatever the temperature, we trust that your heart is warm with love and encouragement and that this will be a meaningful time for you. Uh, welcome to those who are uh, gathered in the sanctuary. It is wonderful to have uh, more faces uh, who we can actually see your eyes, eye to eye. And, and as wonderful as the online community is, <laughs> we are just so glad that we now have both online and in person and just a tremendous thanks to all those people who help support this to be possible our from our our tech people to our music people to those who are helping follow the uh, pandemic guidelines and checking people in to worship it's amazing how all those moving parts jill work together so well one person who is somewhat newer who's now off screen but you would have uh, seen here offering the prelude uh, annabelle patch is our musician today and uh, jerry of uh, van wyck is off, and we are glad, Annabelle, that you're offering your gift of music uh, today in our worship uh, service. And those who are online on Facebook will have already met Megan, and I'm sure she is chatting with you and just helping you to settle in quite nicely. My name is uh, Julian Jackson, and I'm a candidate for ministry. And Annabella asked me this morning, what does that mean exactly, a candidate for ministry? So I wondered if many others might have wondered that at some stage. And it simply means that I've, I've finished my training at Vancouver School of Theology, and I'm kind of in a, a, a phase where I'm just working out what's the next thing that comes along. And in the United Church, we call that a candidate for ministry when you haven't got a placement as yet. And uh, I'm here instead of Simon the Sewer, who is our other leader, and he's on sabbatical. And I yeah. continue to encourage you to pray for him. And we pray that uh, Spirit is with him and with his family so that they are all nurtured and uh, resting together and enjoying this uh, beautiful weather. I feel like I've been transported to Australia for the day. <laughs> Uh, and many of you will um, be aware that on July 1st, uh, the health minister is going to give us some more information about what phase three is going to look like for faith communities. And I think that, like Philip said, we've done so great during June to, to find our way through this hybrid of uh, online as well as in person. And so you uh, would like to watch your inboxes for more information. We don't know anything at the moment, but during the week, keep an eye on that. I, I don't expect uh, too much uh, to, to go backwards, given that the, the um, province is doing so well, but we just need to stay posted to keep, keep ourselves safe, and that will give us a direction for July and for August. That's right. We will be... We will know a whole lot more in a few days, mm -hmm. and we will pass that on to you. Um, you may have noticed that there is a rose on the communion table. We've had roses for a number of weeks now on the communion table. Uh, so if nothing else, the pandemic is, uh, is being fruitful in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I just can't resist uh, one of the uh, photos that I saw on Facebook was of a a newborn who was wearing a lovely little sleeper, Jill, and on the sleeper it said, they did not keep two meters apart. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, indeed, that's true, and we, we are glad for this new uh, arrival. Uh, the baby is Noah James Fulton, and uh, Noah fits into the family of Pat Johnson. Um, Noah's mom, Michelle, is a niece, and uh, Georgina and Christine uh, are cousins. And uh, so Noah was born on the 21st of June in California to Michelle and her husband, Chris, and they are all doing just delightfully well. 
and uh, glad for it. And so may they be well blessed uh, as a family unit. Yeah, Are you, would you like to lead us into our, oh, that is me, I'm next. <laughs> you gave me that knowing look like it's not me, it's you. And uh, uh, the lighting of the Christ candle is that wonderful time in, in our liturgy when we declare again and again the light of Christ. Uh, shining into our world. And uh, we have invited Sophie uh, Angus, uh, who can come on forward to light our Christ candle. Sophie is one of our soloists in the congregation. Indeed, she is today. And uh, Sophie and the other soloists have just been the workhorses of the music here over this past year plus. And we are just so thankful that uh, you, Sophie, and the others have been so willing to keep putting themselves forward again and again. And so we're honored that you light our Christ candle this morning. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive prayer, so uh, um, you will find the words on the screens in the, in the church or on the screens on your computer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We come with all our hopes and longings. We, we come, come with, with all, all our, our disappointments, disappointments and, and dreams. dreams. We come to gain strength for our lives. We, we gather, gather here, here to, to worship God. God. And Philip, will you lead us in a gathering prayer? Absolutely. Let us pray. Most holy God, our creator, the one who, who sends light from the cosmos to the world and beyond, whose breath gives life to all that is, who speaks, and it is so. We are just delighted to gather together and to know that we are in your sacred presence. And may this time be a time that bonds us together with all who call upon you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Saints, I invite us into our time of prayer. And you might begin to get yourself ready just by making sure you're planted well on this good earth of our gods and with a good deep breath in and out. And let's pray. God of all our longings, you are the fire that kindles our hearts with hope and possibility. You fill us with desire for life, and you hear our voices, whether we shout for joy or cry out with sorrow. We trust in you and give thanks for your presence in all the stages of our lives. Help us to be open to the movement of your Holy Spirit in your world. You, Creator, know us better than we know ourselves. You know our hurts and our fears and our discouragements. We are sorry when our actions and our non-actions hurt others. Heal us when we give up hope and allow fear and shallow self-interest to dominate our lives and help us when we lose sight of who we are and forgive us when we make enemies of those you have given us to love. We pray for an end to violence wherever it may arise. <clears throat> violence in our homes, in our communities, on our streets, violence between the nations of your beloved earth. And let us name silently the names of places in the world that come to mind who long for an end to violence. Oh God, hear these our prayers. We pray for all those who are struggling to resist evil, those struggling to promote justice, those whom we know about and those who struggle on silently without our knowledge. And let us now name silently the names of persons or organizations who are working to make this world a better place. God, hear these our prayers. We pray for those suffering in mind and body or spirit, for those who mourn, for those who are facing death. We pray for First Nation communities who grieve old pains that continue to haunt and hurt. Let us name now in our own words, locations or tribal groups as the Spirit moves us. O oh God, hear these our prayers. We pray for the many of us who are settler peoples that in our own pain of hearing stories of past and present harms and feeling discomfort help our ears to be open and our hearts to have compassion upon those who mourn and upon ourselves who continue to be beloved by you And here we insert prayers that come from deep inside us, prayers for ourselves and for our families, 
and our communities. God, hear these our prayers. O Lord, we desire the healing of all of creation. And for this we pray. And we offer to you all the prayers of our hearts, O God. In Christ's name it is that we pray. He is the one who gave us this prayer as a model that we might pray together. And so we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. My name is John Mendes. I am uh, a member of our church's refugee sponsorship team, but most of you will know me simply as Victoria's husband. <laughs> our family moved uh, or, or joined the church back in 2008 when we moved to West Vancouver. Since that time, we've really enjoyed pr uh, attending worship and participating in the life of the church. As I look out at across uh, the sacred space today. It's great to see people here in attendance. We're very much looking forward to seeing you all in person soon. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to clear away the obstacles of our minds that may prevent us from hearing your word and prepare our hearts to hear your truth. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus had crossed in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. 
that one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people wailing, uh, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them, to give her something to eat. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
I grew up with two little sisters. There were others in the family, but uh, that's an, another sermon. But two little sisters. Most of the arguments uh, in the house uh, were centered around how tidy uh, our rooms were kept. Now, I did not do a bad job at mine. Uh, it was mostly clean, especially if you did not take a look inside the walk-in closet and view the heap of clothes on the floor. My goodness, those big walk-in closets can hide a mountain of sin. <laughs> One of our mother's expectations was for us kids to make the bed every day. And I complied on most days. Um, but my sister's responses were, why should I make it? I'm just going to unmake it at night and then have to do it all over again tomorrow. What does it matter? A friend of mine recently shared this same topic. He said, why should I make the bed when I get out of it? When I take off my shoes, I don't tie up the laces. <laughs> And that was a logic I'd never quite heard before. I thought, yeah, yeah, right. So what does it matter? What does it matter? That's a question I learned to ask a lot. And I'm told that my Myers-Briggs personality is drawn to that question. What does it matter? What difference does it make? So what? And I still ask it generously today. But before we begin to explore our story, let's just pause in prayer. Oh Lord, may I never lightly presume to speak your word. Nor may we ever lightly presume to hear your word, for in your word is life, abundant life. Amen. 
In the appointed reading for today, uh, here we have a story about healing. Uh, actually, two healings. Uh, a woman who was sick for a long time, and a little girl who was raised uh, from the dead. People asked for healing, and they got it. Jesus is the Son of God. When he walked this earth, he performed miracles wherever he went, it seemed. What does it matter for us today? And sometimes, I admit, I have a little trouble with these stories of healing. I, I wonder how they will sound to the ears of others. I know some of you have uh, asked God to heal your bodies or to heal the bodies of someone you love. And it has not happened. And sometimes it has happened. I know I have prayed and asked God uh, to heal people, and many times they die anyway. Well, they all die eventually. And if that is the case, what does this story mean for us? I mean, what does it matter? If all of us are going to die anyway, what does it matter if we are healed for a little while? Even the little girl and the woman in the story grew old. They eventually died. Let's think about this. Imagine you're Jairus. You're a powerful man. You're a leader within the synagogue. You're frustrated and you're frightened at the situation. You've tried everything to save your little girl. And nothing is working. And, and Jesus is your last hope. And here he is now delaying by helping this strange woman. When you want him to hurry with everything he's got in him to get himself to your house and save your little girl. And when you arrive home, sure enough, she is dead. And you're grieved beyond words. He raises her. He brings her back to life and health. Yes, Someday she will grow old and die, but for now the family is whole. It is a day of celebration. Uh, does it matter to you? Of course it does if you're Jairus. It means everything. It still matters today. Jairus was a powerful man, and he had to admit he needed help. He humbled himself before Jesus, and Jesus demonstrated his power over life and death. On the days when we get carried away with ourselves, on the, on the days when we think we are in charge, we need to remember Jairus. No amount of power or wealth could save his little girl. And this story reminds us who is the ultimate power and authority in our lives? Now imagine that you might be that little girl. You're sick. You are weak and in pain. You have always counted on your parents to help you. Only they can't. You just keep getting sicker and weaker you're afraid, and, and, and you just slip away into the silent sleep of death. And imagine being woken up from being dead. Imagine the rejoicing in that household. You'll keep hearing that story being told about how you were 12 years old and how this man touched you and brought you to life. The Son of God it was, they will say, and you were healed. When you're on your deathbed, will it matter? Of course it will matter. It matters for us, too. It matters that we understand the power and the compassion of Christ. We can live our lives with the confidence that we are held in a, in a holy love no matter what trials we face, no matter the outcome. Now, imagine that you are the marginalized woman who is sick, 12 years, 
You've suffered terribly. Not only are you weak and sick, you've become something of an outcast in that society, an ongoing uh, disease, especially associated with blood, was often considered ritually unclean. You would be restricted, at least at times of the year, where you could go. We know the pain of not being allowed in our own sanctuary here. I mean, many have not been in this sacred space for well over a year now because of pandemic. And many will not feel safe to do so for some time. It's a source of sadness and frustration just not to be able to rush out and welcome everybody and hug and shake hands and achieve the appropriate intimacy that we once knew, even though we know it's down the road. As real as our pain is, it's really nothing compared to the woman in this story. Imagine not being allowed to be able to worship in her sanctuary for 12 long years because you're not worthy to be in the space. You can't touch anyone or they may be contaminated too. You've suffered having doctors try all kinds of frightening and painful treatments on you. And there's no one to intercede any longer. And you want to talk to Jesus. You know he may be your very last chance but it would be wrong to approach him in public. You decide to take a chance. There's a huge crowd, but maybe no one will notice if you can just manage to sneak through and around and behind and just discreetly reach out and touch the hem of his robe. And right away, you sense something is different about you. You, you feel the healing take place, and then it happens, he knows and he asks, who touched me? And you tell him the, the whole truth about life, and he isn't mad. You tell him you were desperate and you were afraid, and he doesn't look down on you. He doesn't send you away. He looks at you with compassion, and he calls you daughter and the utterance of that word lets you know that you are no longer on the outside. You are most definitely in. You're not an outcast. You're blessed. Does it matter? You bet it does. There's so much we can take from this story. Besides physical healing stories... This woman dared to approach Jesus and to state what she needed. Society had deemed her unimportant and had given up on helping her to have a full, healthy life, and she did not take no for an answer, and we don't have to either. She dared to approach Jesus and tell her truth. This is my situation, Jesus we can too. Jesus did not see this woman as unimportant. He reflected the Creator's love that's given to all people. And we know the scriptural text is just full of stories where God cares for the people that no one thinks are important. Stories where widows and the orphans are fed. Uh, stories where strangers and refugees are welcomed. And the poor and the lame, they're put at the head of the table. Imagine the healing that could happen in our communities and in our country if we were to embrace God's way of thinking. Misogyny would melt away. And women would be equal to men, and not just according to our laws that enshrine it to be so. Asian people would be treated with respect, and Vancouver would not be dubbed the Asian hate crime capital of North America. If God's way of thinking was, enshrined, was embraced 150 years ago or so, the churches in our country would have allied with the 
revolutionary Christ and not the government of the day to create and implement the residential school system. If, if God's way of thinking is embraced today by us, we will listen and listen deeply to the stories that remind us of a past we'd much rather forget. I know that desire to just forget and walk away. And we will not seek quickly to minimize the impact it had and, and still has on our communities if we take up God's way of thinking. Some have told me in recent days that we all just need to get over it. That bad things happened in residential schools only to a few, and we should accept that it was an otherwise decent idea. And some have told me that I should not speak of this in my sermon, as I'm speaking yet again of it in my sermon. And you know, I, I, I believe that sometimes we push back against hard stories because we sense we have a lot at stake. We have a lot to lose. We have invested in the way the world is. And we don't want it to change. At least we don't want it to change in ways that are not in our favor. And you're right. We do have a lot at stake here. And, and I believe that God's way is an ever-creating, ever-learning way. And as the body of, of Christ in the world, I believe God equips us to do the learning that God calls us to do. And, and that in the midst of all the turmoil uh, stories and conversations may cause us to find ourselves in, I really believe God wants us to remember that we continue to be loved with a holy love. It is a love that asks a lot of us. That's true. But it is a love that will not let you go. What does it matter? There's a lot at stake. Nothing less than the kingdom is at stake. The gospel lesson that John uh, re shared with us today is, is about so much more than physical healing. It's about the kingdom of God showing up. It's about the kingdom of God surprising us, taking a step out into our world. You know, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, as we did yet again today, we pray the words, Your kingdom come. And we pray that God will make the kingdom come, the kingdom that Jesus was preaching about, that that kingdom would finally come to pass. A kingdom where the, the poor will inherit, inherit the earth. Uh, the hungry will be filled. And those who weep will laugh once again. In death, it'll be a thing of the past. We pray for that. And as Martin Luther pointed out in his small catechism, small study booklet, God's kingdom will come anyway, whether we pray for it or not. But in this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we are asking that we might be a part of it, that we might know it and live it. There are types of healing that are more important than physical healing, as important as those are. I was a volunteer chaplain at uh, one of the city hospitals for many years, and that's how I met Derek. Uh, I was summoned to visit him uh, in the intensive care unit in that hospital, and I guess that Derek was perhaps 10 years my junior, he was anxious, and he was restless, uh, worried 
that his condition had taken an irreversible turn after a failed piece of surgery. And I, I couldn't describe him as a particularly courageous man, but never having met him before, I sensed that he had a kind soul. And I visited him several times in the first few days of his stay in the ICU. And I learned that Derek, generally speaking, did not handle the twists and the turns of life very well. When something went sideways, usually someone else needed to be there with him to handle it, to pick up the pieces. And I prayed with him at the end of my first visit, in the very late hours of the night. And it was a general prayer, you know, for strength and for calm, for uh, reassurance in the sense that he was not alone. And in the midst of my praying, he, he asked that I would pray that he be healed. And I did. And through the week, I met a few of Derek's family members and learned that, yes, indeed, he was well-loved, but he was not the rock of the family. And so I was surprised when after about a week in ICU, without a waver in his voice, Derek told me that just that morning his medical team had told him that there was really nothing more they could do for him and that they would keep him comfortable. And I felt sadness grip me. And I knew just how scared he must be inside. But you know, it turned out I had nothing to worry about. Uh, he was not ever the rock in his 40-some years of life, but somewhere along the line in there he had rekindled a strong inner faith i never did get from him the full story on that but he was not panicked and he said i always wondered what it would be like to be told it was my last day on earth it's okay i'm ready As it turned out, it was not his last day, but he did spend the next few days saying goodbye to people. People who had been close to him, his family, a few others. And then he was gone. He did not get the physical healing that I prayed for him to have. But it seems to me he got something so much more important. He got peace and calm. It was as if he stepped fully into the kingdom those last few days. He got joy. He got peace. And I just imagined the risen Christ right there at his bedside saying, Son, your faith has made you well. I invite you to step into the kingdom in the midst, in the midst of tough to hear stories that surely we're going to continue to hear for some time. And in the frustration of any debate or disagreement, in the in the reality of a broken and yet deeply beloved world, step into the kingdom. Because Jesus' teaching was that it is already here and still unfolding. Step into it, for it matters. Amen. So be it.
Thank you, Philip, for helping us with that difficult and uh, fascinating passage. You know, and it's fascinating because you read this passage 16 months ago and you think, oh, she touched his dress, and uh, his robe. And then you read it today and you think, wow, the power of touch takes a whole new reevaluation. And then you think, if we are Christ's body, who are we letting touch us? That's so very powerful. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's one of the, uh, every time I come across another gospel story, it's always my favorite. <laughs> so here's yet another. It's, uh, it's just, yes, I has, the stories such as that just have so many layers of meaning. If you sit with the story and just let it speak to you, Uh, we also thank all of those people who uh, contribute to this ministry. We sincerely thank you because we've been able to flourish and thrive all over these last 16 months. And that's fantastic. And we couldn't have done that without the support of those people who give to this congregation. So if you're interested in contributing to our ministry and the work that we do, you will find the website on your screen or you will also find some bowls on your way out from the, from the church today. Now, bowls, is that an Australian expression? Oh, bowls, what do Canadians <laughs> call them? Plates. Plates. Plates, Plates. okay, got it. <laughs> now I know when I was in ministry in Australia, they never knew quite to move for the offering because I called them <laughs> plates. <laughs> See, we always are called to learn something new. And... As we go about our lives in this warm week that is ahead of us, uh, may we continue to be safe. As we look forward to uh, the lightening of restrictions in this pandemic, and as we begin to interact more fully with each other and the world, may we do it with a gentleness uh, and a tenderness and with an intent to search out and to see the face of Christ and the people that we do meet and to speak and, and act and interact in such a way as they recognize the face of Christ in us. And may that be so. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>